Hi everyone, Antonio Lujurice here from StayHungryBeFoolish.com and today I have the honor of speaking with filmmaker Joshua uh, Oppenheimer. Joshua, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, Joshua, you, you've been making films for several years now and um, your latest film, The Act of Killing, um, has had such a huge impression worldwide and it's a powerful surreal uh, reenactment of the mass killings that happened in 1965 in Indonesia which actually resulted in the extermination of over one million Indonesian uh, Indonesians um, obviously you had a big passion for this topic and I know that you worked on this project for over a decade if you can tell us a little bit um, what influenced your interest in making the act of killing well I began this project in collaboration with a community of survivors who were my friends and with whom I was living in a small plantation village outside of the city of Medan which is where I made the act of killing I was making I'd made another film there um, with them about their struggle to organize a plantation workers union and found that their biggest obstacle in organizing a union was fear. They were afraid because their parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents had been in a strong plantation workers union until 1965 and they had been accused of being leftists and put in concentration camps and taken out to be killed as a result of their membership in the union. And the, the people who were struggling to organize a union in the aftermath of the Suharto dictatorship were afraid that this could happen to them again if they were, if they were too militant in their organizing efforts. Mm -hmm. And so essentially fear was their biggest obstacle and we started to, we tried to make a film together to document exactly why they were so afraid the nature of a regime of impunity and i felt that here was a community with whom i was living and who had entrusted me with their stories and and who had entrusted my indonesian crew with, well, with their stories and, and they were they were they 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 asked they, they wanted essentially to show the rest of Indonesia and then the world the nature of the of the of the regime of fear under which they were living and when they and so I felt that it was somehow my responsibility to make a film that would take their situation seriously and we had been working together for uh, we, we as we started filming mm -hmm. uh, specifically about the 1965 killings every time we would film together we would get arrested the police would come, the military would come, and they would stop us from filming. They would take our equipment. Um, they would, and, and it was terrifying for the, it was scary for all of us, but it was particularly terrifying for the survivors yeah. who'd been living in a kind of system of political apartheid ever since the 1965 66 killings. And we, I think we, at that point, we discussed maybe not doing the film. Perhaps it was too dangerous. Perhaps there was no safe way of doing this film. And everybody said, all of the survivors said, no, no, you must. We must continue because it, no one had documented what had happened in this part of Indonesia. We're talking tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people being killed in this one region. And no one had documented it. And at the same time, no one in Indonesia was really speaking about the nature of the present day regime, that it was a regime built by mass murderers on the, ba through, on the celebration and mythologizing of genocide as something heroic. No one wow. was looking at that absurd and grotesque situation and basically I, everybody said, Josh, you must continue, you have to do this, please do this and, the, and then one one of the survivors with whom I was working said, you know, the safe way to do this and the most revealing way to do this will be to film with the perpetrators because they will boast. They will appear to be proud of what they've done. Film their boasting. Film their apparent pride and the audience will see exactly why we're so afraid and they'll see the nature of the regime under which we're living. So I felt as though I had been entrusted with a work of historical, moral and political importance and I was determined to Give it everything that I could. Wow! Yeah, including a, a decade of my life, and, yeah. and and my crew, my my Indonesian crew, gave it a decade of their lives too. And yeah. they can't even put their name on the film because it's too dangerous for them. So there's at the end of the film dozens and dozens of anonymous crew members who are credited as anonymous in the in the credits. 
Yeah, we see that. I remember seeing that. And actually, you mentioned that um, the the victims, the survivors, had suggested that you approach the actual uh, killers, w- which you did. Joshua, if you can say, how did you actually approach them and get them to participate, gain their trust and confidence in actually taking part in making the movie? Well, that was, the, I mean, in a way, the movie is a response to the fact that it was ex- that I, I had to do I didn't have to do almost anything to gain their trust I simply had to treat them with kindness and as a human being um the moment the my, the woman who suggested I first speak to the perpetrators actually suggested I start with my next door neighbor in this village where I had been filming who she explained was the person who had killed her aunt wow. and I went over to his house and met him and he was an old man and I asked him what did he do for a living what had he done for a living just to sort of break the ice and within a mo- within moments he said well I used to be the security guard on this on the plantation the palm oil plantation here but I was promoted to be a manager of the whole plantation because I killed 200 communists on the plantation and I said what do you mean you killed 200 communists he said well there was a union and the members were all communist mm-hmm. and I beat them up until they were unconscious. My men would give me them one by one. I'd beat them till they were unconscious, and then we would drown them in irrigation ditches. And he shows me this. He's not wearing any shirt, and he shows me this, and he's showing his muscles and how he's still quite strong and maybe could still do it, and laughing as he tells me this. And sitting there listening was his 10-year-old granddaughter, as though she'd heard this many times before. She watches on board as though as though she's heard this many times before. And I th- was asking myself, two things at once of course what happened what did he do but also how on earth can he be talking so openly about this and how can he be speaking in front of his granddaughter how does he want to, how does he want to be um how does he want to be seen by her how does he want her to remember him how does he want me to see him how does he want the world to see him and how ultimately does he see himself so starting with him i i filmed every perpetrator i could find and they were all open in that way and the film i i found i was basically asking myself questions of the imagination how do these men imagine themselves how do they want the world to imagine them how do they want uh how do they how do they really imagine themselves? What stories do they tell themselves so that they can live with what they've done? Um, what nightmares do they have that uh, uh, that are lurking b- b- beneath the surface? So I was asking these questions of the imagination at the same time as they were eager, all, all of the perpetrators I met were eager to not just boast about what they did, but show me what they did, to take me to the places where they killed, to reenact how they did it, to they would complain afterwards that they hadn't brought machetes along to use as props or friends along to play victims. Um, or, and I came to understand if I let these men dramatize what they do, what they are already inclined to do, namely to dramatize what, they, what they've done. And then film the process and combine the process of the making of their dramatizations with the with the dramatizations themselves we would essentially have created a new form of documentary a documentary that answers these questions of the imagination how they want to be seen and how they see themselves and that's exactly what i proposed to them i said look you've participated in one of the biggest mass killings in human history i want to understand what you know, your whole society is based on it. Your lives are shaped by it. What does it mean to your society? What does it mean to you? You want to show me what you've done? Go ahead and show me what you've done. I'll film the process and we'll it, combine all this material and thereby create a kind of new form of, of documentary film. And that's how that's how the process evolved. Anwar Congo, the main character in the act of killing, was the 41st perpetrator with whom I filmed. So by the time I met him, this method and this approach and this explanation was already quite, you know, was, was what I was telling everybody. Mm-hmm. This was what I was asking people to, to consider doing. And Anwar became the main character in the film because he had this, yeah. used the reenactments, used the dramatizations to go somewhere very deep. And ac- actually, all, all these men, um, Joshua, obviously 
they they've never been apprehended or punished for their crimes actually they're they're considered as heroes right and they're, they're like you said they still hold powerful positions mm. from your experience like how, how could this be usually like you know in our parts of the world we when we hear about these kind of crimes and we know about them there's a punishment that comes along but not there so how could it be and having been in contact with them would you say that they showed any signs of remorse or that they felt a prisoner of their past? There, I think those are great questions. Um, as Adi, one of the killers in the film says, no one's ever been punished for the Native American genocide. No one's ever been punished for segregation. Mm -hmm. No one's ever, and, and, no, and, and in a way, no one's ever been punished for the British Empire. No one's ever been punished for the excesses of, uh, you know, of the of the Cultural Revolution and the re the regime of terror based upon which still is in place in China and allows all of our the, the computers through which we're speaking to each other to be made cheaply enough that we can afford them. So we depend on other people's suffering actually for our everyday lives because in most places, I would say, people who commit atrocities are not punished and become the powerful men in their societies. So, you know, we normally when we hear from perpetrators, once they're already designated as perpetrators, they either deny what they've done or apologize for it. But that's because once they're designated as perpetrators, they've been removed from power. They've mm -hmm. been overthrown. They've been they're standing in the, the dock of a court. Or, or they're at least being forced to admit that what they've done was wrong. Here, uh, these men are in ch have never been overthrown, mm -hmm. and they've they they are they've won. They're still in power. They still rule over the society, and that means they still have the opportunity to justify what they've done. Mm -hmm. Now, if you and I had killed somebody, and I hope we wouldn't, but we are lucky enough never to know, if you and I had killed someone. And we had the opportunity to justify to ourselves and to our communities and our, and our, our societies what we've done. I'm 100% sure we would because it would save us the torment of living with what we've done, with living with our conscience. So even if we know it's wrong, we would justify it. And as Adi, one of the Death Squad members in the film says, killing is the worst thing you can do. Mm -hmm. it, it's the worst thing you can do, but if you but if you get paid well enough or it's in your interest to do it, do it. But then you need a good excuse. So after these men killed for power and for money, they then needed a good excuse. And the government provided them an excuse in the form of propaganda. And they became quickly addicted to that propaganda. And the propaganda is justification and celebrates mass killing as heroic uh, struggle and once they've justified what and, and once they celebrate uh what they've done the, the paradox is that it appears we see them celebrating what they've done in the very first scene we, one of the very first scenes we see with anwar and indeed the first scene i filmed with him mm -hmm. we see him dancing where he's killed a thousand people it looks like he's remorseless at, at first because it's such a shocking moment right but actually, if you think about what I've just said, and I think what, what we find really through over the course of the act of killing is that this celebration of atrocity, this justification of atrocity, which seems to be a symptom of remorselessness, is in fact a very human reaction to the fact that they know it's wrong. It's an attempt to justify to themselves what they've done. And, the, and where that paradox spills over into tragedy or becomes tragic is that the celebration of atrocity then becomes a, a tool to keep everybody else afraid and it becomes a cover for committing evil, further evil. So once you've corrupted yourself by killing once and then you justify it to cling to the no to, to, to run away from your conscience essentially, then it becomes possible and to kill again and killing again becomes proof that it wasn't wrong to do it the first place right. in the first place and so then you can kill again you can torment your survivors you can steal from them you can oppress them and blame them for 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 blame the victims for what happened and so ironically i think what's the, and maybe this is the real secret to the journey anwar congo the main character's journey in the act of killing ironically what begins what appears to be a symptom of remorselessness at the beginning of the film becomes 
sort of the trap door into Anwar's conscience and into the conscience of a whole regime, which is why when the film is screened in Indonesia, people see, oh my gosh, this is a dark mirror held up to our whole regime, to our whole society. And it, and there's no going back. There's no pretending that everything's okay after watching the film. Mm. And you, you mentioned how Okay, it, it, in the aspect of killing, how they were making excuses to justify their actions. At some level, Joshua, don't you think that um, as human be beings, don't we all have these qualities? Maybe not like what you said to the same as intensity as being killers, but the same qualities in our daily actions with... I, ab absolutely. We all use storytelling to escape from our most bitter and indigestible truths. I mean, you and I, as I said, the computers we're talking to, e to each other through are haunted by the suffering of the people who made them. It's also true of the clothes we're wearing, the, the, the furniture we're sitting on. We, and how do we, how do we live with that? We, we, we deal, well, first of all, we're very dis distant from the suffering. Um, and we, and, if you buy a Louis Vuitton handbag, you 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 cover up the or you buy an iPhone where the workers have netting on the balconies of their dormitories so that they so that they don't throw themselves off in despair. Mm -hmm. We buy this sleek iPhone. People queue up for days when the new model of the iPhone comes out in order to buy it because they because we have fetishized other people's suffering. We've taken other people's suffering and we've wrapped it in a in a beautiful packaging and we think it's beautiful whereas which is exactly what Anwar Congo does in the waterfall scene where he imagines yeah. himself in heaven and imagines the his victims there to thank him and celebrate uh, thank him for killing them and sending them to heaven he's taken something horrible and wrapped it up as beautiful because it's easier to live with that way i think i think we all use storytelling and language and fantasies to cope with the, the the scary, frightening parts of our reality. Absolutely. And would you say, what would be probably like the biggest thing that you learned having having spent like so much time and so close with them for such a long period of time? Would you say that you came out came out of that experience and have and learned something? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think I. I think what I just was say all of these things I've been saying are things I learned from the film but I I think I think that the film filmmaking process has made me much less judgmental I've learned that when we make the leap from saying that someone is a someone is a human being who has done evil to someone is an evil human being we denounce an entire life an entire person and we feel entitled to make that judgment because we assume while we make the judgment that we are good. And so we sort of cling to a fantasy that the world is divided into good guys and bad guys, what I think I've called the Star Wars morality. And we we cling to that that, that fantasy is an example of storytelling helping us escape from our most bitter and uncomfortable truths, this one being that actually we're all human and that the, every act of evil in human history has been perpetrated by human beings just like us and i think that if i think that if we want to prevent if we're serious about preventing these things from ever happening again which they unfortunately keep happening again we have this mantra never again but it always seems to be taken to mean never again to us if we really mean never again we have to look at what really happens and what really happens is people human beings destroy other human beings again and again and again and we it's painful to see that but unless we see that it's human beings who do it there's no chance we have no chance in preventing these things from happening and i think when viewers see themselves in anwar for us for a moment ideally for much of the film but but even if only for a moment, that whole Star Wars fantasy collapses because we see he's a person like us and we identify with that horror that he must be feeling as he realizes that there's bitter truths about his reality that he will never escape because he's destroyed people. Exactly. So like it's a little bit like we separate ourselves, like you said, and label the, uh, these people like when we we hear about them or we read about it in the newspaper we tend to label them as being 
I don't know, either a monster or separating, almost like as if they're not human beings. And what you've shown with the act of killing is to show that, no, they're also human beings. So what you're, what you're saying is probably like, unless we don't break that, you know, that boundary where we separate ourselves and see that there actually are human beings, which is probably scary to us to admit, that will, will, th things will never change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the moment you say that they're bad, if, if, you, the, if you say the people who perpetrate atrocities are monsters, mm -hmm. how do you prevent atrocity? Well, you have to get all the monsters. You have to round them up, put them in prison. You could kill them, whatever, but you have to eliminate them somehow from the social we fold. And that, of course, is the beginning of repetition. And I think we, you know, then you become a monster because you're hunting people down and you're eliminating them. I think that we we are all so close to um i mean we are perpetrators let's just be straight about it we're all invested we're all dependent on other people's suffering for our survival as i've said we're all and we have you know one story we tell ourselves to deal with that fact is like is economics you know we tell ourselves that we need permanent positive growth everywhere in the world forever and don't really think about the, the the Malthusian consequences of that population expansion economical disaster uh, sorry e ecological disaster right. and we and and that sort of technocratic discourse distances ourselves from actually the consequences of our actions and i think we need we need much more imaginative solutions than um you know, buying organic apples or whatever. You know, we need we need really collective, profound solutions. And I think what I hope the act of killing maybe helps people do is come into come into contact w with the experience of alienation. What what I'm talking about is alienation in a way, right? Mm -hmm. What is it like? But we read about that. You know, we're alienated from the suffering of others. We we purchase people suffering in nicely shiny wrapped up products but we don't really think about what does that feel like and i think when viewers at the end of the act of killing feel devastated which some do yeah. it's because they're sensing the isolation the loneliness the fragility the fear and the yeah. and the hel helpless the the the, the, the apparent helplessness that leads us to run away from dealing with what to, from actually reaching out to each other and dealing with what with these problems you, you know the, the message that the perpetrators are te are human is is a terrible message because it makes us realize maybe we could all have this in us maybe we do all have this in us indeed we are all perpetrators but it's also a hopeful message because it implies that we can build ways of living together ways of caring for each other societies where we think before we harm each other, where we learn to love each other more, where we learn to empathize with each other more. And in fact, you know, that is, of course, the only hope. We're all in this together and we have to, 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 to survive and care for each other together. Yeah. And you were mentioning a little bit about the message um, in the movie, Joshua, from, for ha from having watched it, to me, was not a documentary of a series of crimes uh, uh, that took place. It felt like there was other intentions and motives behind that. Um, is is a little bit what you just said probably your motive and the message that you were hoping to get across to the audience? Yeah, I think absolutely. The film is is trying to make us all realize that to think about what happens when we build. The film is not about the history. It's not exactly. about the past. It's about how the past is alive in the present. Mm -hmm. And particularly by holding a mirror, if you like, up to Indonesian society, which where we see what happens when we as human beings build our normality on terror and lies. I also hope to hold a mirror up to all of us and to, to lead all of us to ask, you know, wait, if we are all closer to perpetrators than we like to think, how shall we reimagine? How can we think carefully about how we imagine ourselves and, and uh, imagine our life together as human beings on this planet? You know, I, I think that um, 
yeah maybe that is my that is my that is my motive yeah and you you mentioned a little bit how you know you hear about so many efforts right that are out there efforts of people that have been made to prevent these kind of things from happening yet there's been so many atrocities or genocides for decades and like you said there probably still will be many in your opinion Joshua do you feel that we're actually progressing in in these efforts to make a difference I, don't know. I really don't know um no. it's beyond me this is not yeah. I'm not I don't know even how one would begin to answer that I'm not I'm not <laughs> saying one can't it's just yeah. it's not my I'm not an expert on on uh, on, on the human capacity for evil in all circumstances, much less historically, which is you're yeah. asking a historical question. But I think that I don't. I mean, I think my task as an artist is to be hopeful. Mm-hmm. Is to is to be hopeful enough to find it worthwhile to deliver mm-hmm. a terrible message. So exactly. I think that what I see is. You know, to create a vision as bleak as the one in the act of killing, you have to have the hope that it'll make a difference, or you wouldn't spend a decade doing it. I think that, you know, I see that we're we're kind of the final shot in the act of killing, where you see them dancing, mm-hmm. even after everything Anwar may or may not have realized consciously. We see him and Herman and the other thugs dancing at the mouth of this enormous fish, and you just have this sense, this image that we are utterly lost in our fantasies. And they're dancing this dance macabre on the edge of, of, of the abyss. And I think that in a way as we, you know, rush headlong towards being being inundated, being, being literally drowned in the sea that we cause to rise through global yeah. warming um, <laughs> and, and the mass extinction. And I, I think that we have to really, we have to really be prepared to, make some sacrifices together and to and to work together to, to make change. I, I don't yeah. I don't know that I'm an optimist, but I'm an optimist enough to feel it's worthwhile to be loudly pessimistic. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, um now like the I, I think the movie has been uh, premiering a little bit worldwide, but in, uh, in Indonesia, Joshua, have you heard about any uh, responses from yeah. from the survivors? How is it going? Well, if there's a cause for optimism, it's there. I mean, yeah. the film has triggered a sea change in how Indonesia talks about its past. There's uh, the film cannot be cannot be released commercially in Indonesia because they have political film censorship, okay. and uh, what what that what that means. I, I don't think that she knows that I'm being recorded here, so she, we have a little phone call in the background. It's okay. It's okay. Um, it's in French, so I can probably just block it up. Um, I'm sorry because I know you're in Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> but I, basically, to get around the to get around so so to get around the censors, what we've done is we've shown the film to Indonesia's leading journalists, producers of Indonesia's leading news outlets. Uh, publishers as well as Indonesia's leading filmmakers, historians, human rights groups, survivors groups, mm-hmm. uh, artists, writers, and throughout the autumn and they all they all really loved the film and we encouraged them to then take the film back to their networks and hold screenings. And on starting last December on International Human Rights Day, people these groups started holding screenings all over the country. And since then, it's grown to probably 300 or more screenings now mm-hmm. in 95 cities. And with you know hun- hun- tens of thousands of people watching the film, but the film has provoked a national conversation, which is much bigger than that. The media in Indonesia is now, for the first time in 47 years, investigating the genocide as a genocide, reporting on it extensively, oh, wow. talking about what happened. And um, there's just this sense that the film has come to Indonesia like the little child in the emperor's new clothes, pointing at the king and saying, look, the king is naked. And actually everybody knew the king was naked, right. but nobody had the courage to say so. But once it's been shown so forcefully mm-hmm. and so emotionally and by the perpetrators themselves, these men who should be enjoying the fruits of their victory are broken, destroyed, hollow, damaged by what they've done. Once that's happened, there's no going back. There's no pretending this is not the case. There's no stuffing the genie back in the bottle. And so there is this national 
discussion about what happened and then about recovering what was lost because mm -hmm. the act of killing isn't just about killing human beings it's also about killing ideas killing communities killing culture killing hope mm -hmm. and yeah killing values and so there's this movement to recover what was lost to talk about what happened pushing the government for an official apology pushing for a truth commission pushing for then reconciliation but reconciliation can only happen once there's an establishment of the truth and then hopefully there will also be a movement against the corruption and the gangsterism that and the gross inequalities of wealth all of which have been built on the genocide and so yeah, the, the the best part of releasing the act of killing is the change that it's making in yeah. Indonesia now. And the and the survivors groups, of course, are the most energetic in screening the film. But really, all as all all layers of Indonesian society, apart from the military, the police, and the paramilitary group, and the most corrupt politicians, are are have been su really supportive of the film. Wow. And how about? Um the perpetrators a little bit. Have you been in touch at all with uh, Anwar? Yeah. How's it go? Yeah, like, what was their response or what, what's going on now after the release of the movie? Anwar's seen the film. Okay. Anwar was very moved by the film. Mm -hmm. He was very emotional in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in a positive way, I'd say. He said, this film is really what I thought I was making. This film shows what it's like to me, be me, because of course, as you see in the film, he's shooting scenes and watching them, shooting scenes and watching them, shooting yeah. scenes and watching them. So he's, he knows what's in the film as he's going. And as the film became more and more dark, Anwar's absolutely part taking the decisions to make the film more and more dark. And so Anwar, uh, Anwar, by the time he by the time he saw the film, by the time the film was finished, he knew what kind of film he was making. And he said, this film shows what it's like to be me. It's an honest film. And I will remain loyal to the film. Mm -hmm. And indeed, he has remained loyal to the film. And he and I are in touch, I'd say, every few weeks. Okay. We, I, I don't say that we're, f maybe friendship is the wrong word, but I think we both have love for each other as mm -hmm. human beings. Uh, Herman loves the film. He's not surprising because I think along the way he discovers acting and he <laughs> develops an actor's commitment to the truth, an yeah. actor's loyalty to the truth, and he loves the film. I haven't shown the film to the political leaders who have only cameos in the film because that would be dangerous for everybody trying to get the film out. I assume they will not like the film. I hope they won't like the film mm -hmm. because the film right. is meant to expose them mm -hmm. as emblematic not as particularly the main villains but as emblematic of a regime of corruption and Adi Zulkadri the other member of the death squad I haven't shown him the film because he's still powerful mm -hmm. and if he were to see the film those political leaders would see the film so I feel it's unsafe to show him the film okay. but he by the time he I also felt that there, he won't be surprised he doesn't come into the film trying to glorify it himself he comes into the film saying what we did was wrong the government should apologize and so forth and he leaves the film saying this film is going to make us look bad so he yeah. knows exactly what the film's going to do and we are in fact not on good terms at the end of the shooting you can see this scene where we're fighting in a car he's driving and I'm mm. arguing with him about you know whether about the Geneva Conventions and about war crimes and about history. So mm -hmm. I felt he understood what the film is by the time he finished making the film. He did say, make only one comment when the film came out, which is that he said, why? He said, this film is now screening all around the world. Why am I not getting rich for the, from this? So <laughs> that was his only <laughs> comment about the film since it's come out. <laughs> and um, I, I would have wanted you to elaborate. I heard maybe there's, is there another project in the way? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Once, as I said earlier, once I when I started filming with the when I was filming with the survivors, it was dangerous. But when I started with filming with the killers, it was like the regime rolled out this red carpet for our process. Okay. You know, they flew, they fly ministers up to act in the film from the ministers in the government to act in the film. They produce a TV talk show, this a state television talk show to hype the film mm -hmm. while we're still shooting it. Um, and once I was working with the perpetrators, it was like I was in the shadow of these very – this sort of blind spot or shadow of these very powerful men, and I was beyond suspicion. I was in their inner circle in the eyes of the regime and the military. So I was actually able to continue shooting with survivors. In fact, it was a cover which allowed me to safely shoot with survivors, provided the perpetrators didn't know – 
what I was doing. So if okay. I, I just go back to the villages where I started this and I would say I'm now, I would tell them I'm going to film a friend's irrigation project. I right. thought of something sufficiently boring that Anwar and his friends would not want to come. Mm -hmm. And I, I then filmed with this family of survivors and they find out through my work who killed their son. Okay. And the youngest brother in this family decides how is he supposed to raise and, and how is he supposed to raise his children in the aftermath of I mean, living alongside perpetrators who, who are boastful and lording their crimes over them. Yeah. So he decides to meet everybody who was still alive, who was involved with his brother's death. And he becomes like a kind of one man truth and reconciliation process in a country where there will be no truth and reconciliation, or at least before the act of killing came out, it seemed highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. So that's the other film. It's, it's part of the same project in a way. It won't. It's not a, another thousand hours of material and another three years of editing. It should be along in about a year. Oh, perfect! And thank you so much, Joshua. I know you're in Paris right now, getting ready for the premiere there as we speak. So that's I th right. Thank you so much for having taken the time. And if I can say, I think you you're a role model and inspiration to show how one person could make a difference. Oh, and, thank you and, very much. Thank you so much. I just will say one thing. We should yeah. thank the the incredibly brave, hardworking Indonesian crew, especially my co-director, without whom this would be really impossible. Absolutely. And who, oh, thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you so much, Antonio. Thank you, right. Joshua.